Well, for, this isn't one of my skills, by the way. I think this is one of the ugh, biggest Bibles I've ever seen. Do you want to see? Pete told me Daz found it in a charity shop, and I think it was a fiver. And literally, I don't think it's been opened. But if I did that, you could probably read the le- you probably read it. This is one of the biggest Bibles ever. So if anyone's got any bad eyes, want to have a look, have a read. It doesn't say what version. I think it's the New King James. But it's pretty good, that, isn't it? A fiver. Um, so this one's my one. Got a magnifying glass. So today, everyone, good Friday, isn't it? Good Friday. So we're going to look shortly at a psalm and then how that links that to today. And we're going to hopefully answer why is today good? Because it's a weird term for someone to be murdered. You generally don't call that a good day, do you? But this is different. So guilt, shame, regrets, we all have them. However, today is the day when that could disappear. And not just today, any moment in time. However, it becomes more prominent with today. It's a day of hope for us all, if you're a Christian. There's a reason why the calendar calls it good. If only people in the world would stop and take notice. And the first question to us all here today, including myself, Is this a good day to you? Has the death of a Jewish man over 2,000 years ago, has it had any impact on your life? If not, maybe today is the day that it does. So this morning's message is for all people. However, I'm categorizing them into three groups of people and you can think which one you're in. So we have one, believers in Jesus. The second group, are believers who are deep in sin and the third group are non-believers and I believe what we're going to study this morning it should speak to all of our hearts in whatever way that is so we're going to read Psalm 51 shortly Psalm 51 if you want to find it however let's set the scene and give it some context So if you're in the second or the third group, a believer who is in sin or a non-believer, then you might think that you're too deep in sin to be forgiven. Maybe you think your sins are so bad that they are unforgivable. Well, let's play top trumps. And I don't expect no one to put the hand up. (laughs) Um, I don't want to embarrass anyone. But... Who in here, just answer it in your your own heart, who in here has slept with another person's wife or husband and then had that person killed? Can anyone say they've done any worse sins than murder and adultery? Now, to God, sin is sin. However, whether you're a murderer, an adulterer, a liar, a thief, it doesn't matter. We're all sinners and we all need to turn to Jesus. But I'm playing some context. So who am I talking about? Most of you know it's King David who I'm referring to. King David. This, this, what I just explained, was his testimony. Now, whether you're a powerful king like David or a multi-millionaire celebrity or just a normal person like me and you, hopefully, um, repentance looks the same it's also the same God who forgives and the exact same standards if David can be forgiven of murder and adultery then so can you and me and 2 Samuel 11 which will come to shortly that's where it tells the story of the David Bathsheba and Uriah sin as I mentioned is sin Sin is conceived in a look, thought, feeling, or deed, to name a few. David's was initially a look which fueled lust. This was the initial start which resulted in devastation to him and other people's lives, which we'll get to. He saw something and acted upon that fleshly desire. So you can't stop everything that you see. That's impossible, 
However, you can control what follows in your mind. So I ask us all today, what are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What feelings do you have? Are any of these sinful? If uncontrolled, how do you know it won't spiral out of control and end in horrific scenes and events like David's life? Do you think David woke up one morning and think, I'm going to kill someone today? Do you think he woke up and thought, I'm going to sleep with another man's wife today? I doubt he thought like that. It's a natural chain of events. And the initial thing was that lust, what he saw, which we'll get to shortly. So what can, what can we do and how can we learn from David's life in our lives? Well, there's one good example from a man called Joseph, the man with the colourful coat, as you all know. So a, a three-letter word, if you're in this scenario and we can learn from Joseph, it's run. Run away. And if we go to the next one, please, Pete, we're going to look. We're going to compare... I think I've made the text too small, but I'll hopefully speak loud. We're going to compare Joseph initially with King David and how those outcomes were different. So I'm going to read Genesis 39, 6 through 11, which says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph so he's living in Potiphar's house. He's Joseph is second in command in Egypt, a super powerful person. And the, his boss's wife is looking at him with desire. He's a, he's a good looking person, as it said. And she said, lie with me, eight. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house and he has put at, he has put all that he owns in my charge there is no one greater in this house than i and he has withheld nothing from me except for you because you are his wife how then could i do this great evil and sin against god and just pause there because david also says this sinning against god so Joseph didn't say, how could I sin against your husband? His initial thought was, the main priority was, I'm not doing this act, one, because it's evil, and secondly, because I don't want to sin against God. 10, it says, as she spoke to Joseph day after day. So picture yourself as Joseph. He's in this house working, and this woman, I'm presuming she's good looking because she's obviously the wife of the most powerful man in Egypt so it says day after day she was probably going to Joseph and trying to lure him into bed basically so what did Joseph do it says he did not listen to her to lie beside her and be with her and then now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household were was there inside she, so basically the house is empty so this might be a moment for Joseph where he thinks no one's watching I can, I can get away with this she keeps asking she keeps trying to push herself on me now the house is empty no one's going to find out but Joseph was a godly man and can anyone hide from God no matter where you are no matter whether you're in a room by yourself God sees all our sins regardless so what did Joseph do? 12 it says, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. So she tried to grab him and he ran. He ran away. And unfortunately, it didn't end well the next scene for Joseph. Because even though he was loyal and he, his standards were set, he still got chucked in prison after this, unfortunately, because she lied and said he was forcing himself on her or what have you. So that is what we should do when sin, and it could be a woman, it could be a man, it could be a friend saying, come into this pub, let's have a lot of beers. It could be a friend saying, let's go into this place. It might be somebody saying, let's watch this video. 
you can relate Joseph's story to whatever situation. If people are trying to lure you, lure you into sin and you know it's wrong, then you need to stick up and set your foundation on Jesus and say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's what David should have done. And David was after Joseph. So he would have known this story. He would have known the scriptures. So let's contrast this with David. And we're going to read a portion of 2 Samuel. Please beat the next one. 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 5. So this is David's testimony. So it says, verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David saw something. He, he, he maybe, I don't, it doesn't say we can only, I don't want to presume or assume. However, we don't know how many times he'd been out there looking. We don't know if this was a one-off occasion. We don't know whether something happened before it. It doesn't say, but he saw a beautiful woman. So what did he do? Did he remove that thought and run like Joseph back downstairs? So let's see what David did. Verse three. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? For David sent messengers and took her and when she, came in, when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. Five, the woman conceived and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Pretty shocking, isn't it, really? We don't know his motives. We don't know whether because he was the king, the most powerful man in Israel, whether he thought, you know what, I can have anything go on. And how many people in our world today think money, status, power, they can just have anything they want, including another person's wife or husband. Somebody reported back to David in this passage and said, in, the, in a just paraphrase, basically, she's married. So in that sense, oh, I don't know whether David was married to be fair, but as soon as somebody says she's married, that should be it for David. Okay, door shut. She's a, she's a taken woman. You move on. But no, he requested her to come over. And then they obviously conceived and bore a child. And after this scene, he um, plotted to have her husband killed in battle. So it was, it was an evil he, very evil what he did to conspire to have her husband killed. He wanted her so much and the lust completely overthrew him and that's what happened. So how can we relate? Kill sin early before it kills you. So that's the context of Psalm 51. So hopefully you've all got a good understanding of, and the feelings that David may have had after this. So we're going to read now, please, Pete, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, you can see it there. Psalm 51. So it says at the bottom there, I can't even see it, it says, A contrite sinner's prayer for pardon for the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So I'm going to read Psalm 51 and then we'll see what it, what it says. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop 
and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. By your favour, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. You can breathe. That's a long one to read. Did you, was, you, was you following Pete? Was it going well? I wasn't looking. Um, so let's just open with a word of prayer, then we'll see what this passage has to say. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us through your word, speak to us in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we will learn from the way Joseph acted in times of temptation. Lord, let us not be like David and give in to whatever that, that lust or guilt, that sin, whatever that may be that might tempt us to do things that we know we shouldn't do. Lord, I pray we'll learn from Joseph and not from David. However, I pray if, if there is a David here today or whenever somebody might be listening to it, I pray, Lord, that they will see the forgiveness of God Lord, I pray that they will come, come back to you, repent of the sin and come back because you're a loving and merciful God, as we will see shortly. So I pray you'll keep us all present through this time, remove any thoughts or any distractions, and I pray you'll speak to us through your word and through your spirit. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 51. So let's, we're not going to go through it all because it would be Easter Sunday and my kids have Easter eggs to find soon. So we're going to look at, I've just picked out a few verses that we're going to go through and let's just see what the word of God says to us all. So initially, Pete, we're going to look at verse one, which is number, number nine, please. Verse 1, and we'll, I've titled this, God's Attributes. God's Attributes. So let's read it, then we'll see what it says. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. So he starts with, be gracious. So David starts his plea, by asking God to be gracious to him. And the word can be show favour, have pity, have mercy. He starts with an acknowledgement of his sin. Repentance starts with an awareness, a hatred and a guilt of sin. And David also uses the same word in the next one, please, in Second Samuel. So this, it, this portion of scripture is quite sad so second samuel 12 21 through 23 says this is after the event um, then his servant said to him meaning david what is this thing that you have done while the child was alive you've all right you fasted and wept but when the child died 
you arose and ate food. This is the child that it hit him and Bathsheba had. Um, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So the same word gracious is the one we just read in that context. And this is a super sad story. Some people think that sin doesn't impact others. However, in this example, David's lust conceived the child. Then because of judgment to David, the child died. And we have no idea why this happened. We have hope in knowing that children in this passage it says David says I will go to him so David believed that he would see that child one day in paradise so this baby died um, so that baby now is in heaven but it's it, it's just a, a sad thing what happened so this thought had to be on David's mind as he poured out his heart in this um, another key note God will forgive you however he might not take the consequences away of your sin David is asking God to have mercy on him so what else do we know about the God of the Bible and the next one please so we're still on verse one so what else do we know about the God of the Bible is a loving God a great God a compassionate God and a forgiving God and a just God as he blots out the sins. Not a distant, far away God who can't be known. This is a personal God who cares for you and me. David's only hope was in the belief that God's favour, mercy and grace would set him free from the bondage of sin. And the same forgiveness is also available for you and I. So that is the God of the Bible. So we're going to look now. So we know his foundation is a plea for mercy. So we're going to look at verses 3 and 4, please. And we're going to look now at man's accountability. So you and I, we are accountable for everything that we do, think, say, act. Whatever that may be, it's on us. So let's just read it first, verse 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So take a note of that. David didn't mention the good works that he had done. He didn't say, remember that giant Goliath who I knocked down? He didn't say, remember how brave I was? He didn't list his accomplishments as a king. He didn't say, look at all these um, tribes, nations, whatever. Look at all these people that we, we killed and defeated. None of that is applicable. He wanted pardon. He said, please pardon me. So n n our accomplishments don't make any difference to a sinner with a holy and righteous God. And how many people believe that in the world? People believe that, oh, God will accept me the way I am. It, you know, it doesn't matter. I've not done the, I'm not like David. I've not done those type of sins. I mean, I've done the little sins, but who hasn't? And that is the problem. Who hasn't sinned? There's only one person who, who hasn't sinned. But it's a sad thing to think that people who may believe in a God and they believe that he'll just overlook your sin. A God can't be a God. He can't be just all-knowing and powerful to just let sinners come into heaven with their own sin. He can't just turn the other cheek and look away, which some people believe. There needs to be a sacrifice. You need to be perfect to enter heaven. And I ask us all now today, put your hand up if you are perfect. And if you, no one in the world would dare raise the hand and we could ask that to the whole world and nobody would raise the hand. But one person in history, he could raise his hand and say, 
I have not sinned. He, he is perfect, which we'll get to. So David didn't blame Bathsheba. As everyone thought, does Bathsheba get away with this in this story? Because I've not mentioned her name once. She was in the act as well. But you need to think David was a super powerful king. If she said no, I guess he could just say, kill her. So she still sinned, but I'm guessing in that time, maybe it would have been hard for to, to say no to the king, but she, she was still to blame as well. But David didn't blame Bathsheba. He didn't blame God. He took the responsibility on himself. No one told him to look and, and act upon what he saw. He freely followed his own sinful desires. And I ask you today, are you blaming somebody else for your sin? Are you a slave to sin due to a lack of accountability? It is you and I who sin. Take ownership of this and repent to God. And it says, my sin is ever before me. And whether anybody can relate, this is, it's a constant for, it's a regret, it's torture. He can't get rid of this feeling. It was on his mind. Maybe he woke up thinking about this. Maybe he went to bed thinking about this. This sin of what he'd done, he'd done was just constant in his mind and he couldn't get rid of it. And that is what happens when your mind, spirit, soul has this realization of sin. It's constant and you cannot get rid. And this is super important because you might be like, did David feel like this right after he went with Bathsheba? Did he feel like this right after he had Uriah killed? The answer is no. The timeline is about one year after the event when, this, when he wrote this psalm. So one year after is when he pleased to God. But, but, but before that, there wasn't a plea. Only when Nathan the prophet challenged him, did he realize the horror of his sin. And I ask you and I today, has your conscience been, like, been diluted to sin like the world's? Because the world celebrates and accepts sins, do you? Does your soul, does sin no longer have any impact on you? And if this is you today, let's look at verse 4, which we'll carry on. David says, against you, you only, I have sinned. And Joseph also said the same thing, didn't he? He said he wasn't going to do it because he didn't want to sin against God. And David is saying the same thing. David hurt a lot of people. He hurt Bathsheba. He hurt her husband. If they had family, he hurt the family. He would have hurt his friends. Imagine you, you, you work for David and he does that. What would you think of him? A baby died because of what he did. Lots of people were hurt in what David did. However, he's pleading to God, saying that only to God he has sinned. And what does this mean? Well, the God who provided Israel with the commandments to set them apart from all the other nations, the God who sustains our breath, the God who gives life, the God who created us in his image, David sinned against him. And if you feel like this today, how you might have fell way short of God's standards, maybe you feel unworthy and that somehow you've let God down, if that's even possible. We need to repent, acknowledge our guilt and shame, and come back and be forgiven. And that's which we'll get to shortly. Come back and be forgiven. And I touched on it before, but, but the end of verse 4 says, And done what is evil in your sight, nothing can be hidden from God. When we stand before God, we will stand with everything exposed. All our sins, he, God will see everything. And I ask us all today, would you want to stand before God in your righteousness? Would you want to stand before God 
with all your sins exposed on the wall behind me and God could see all those sins, the lust, the thieving, the stealing, the lying, the hatred, the anger. Would you want all that exposed when you die one day? I would hate for God to pull up a list of my sins for him to see and for me to see. However, we need to thank, if you're a Christian here today, then when you stand before God, you will not stand in your own righteousness because when you trust in Jesus, you get his righteousness. So now when you stand before God, what does God see? He sees Jesus in you. He sees a clean slate. He sees a whiteboard. Your sins have been erased, which we'll get to. So please, if you get nothing today and you're a non-believer, do not leave it too late and stand before God in your own righteousness, because that would be a horror show. So let's, let's keep moving. Verse 7, we're going to look at next. Verse 7, which is the board. The board, and this is very important, with it also being Good Friday, the board. So verse 7 says, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. If you want to know more about hyssop, speak to Jeff, because he knows a lot more about it than me. However, it says purify, and mostly this word in, in the Old Testament means is sin. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, David said that he has sinned against the Lord. So that word is, it translates to sinned. And the purify can mean to sin or to miss or miss the way, go wrong, incur guilt, a forfeit. And I think I got a quote from Martin Luther and he said the purify can mean de-sin. So it could be, it could mean de-sin me with hyssop and hyssop for the clever people in the room is a plant used for medicinal and religious slash ritual purposes and it was used a few times in the old testament and the main example of this hyssop is of the exodus um, so we're going to read next exodus 12 21 through 23 and if you were here for the bible study last week he obviously talked about the Passover. So in this scene, the plagues had happened and God's last um, request was for people to put the blood on the doorpost. So let's just read this one. It says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So they use the hyssop branches to dip on the board and they put it on the doorposts and that saved them from death. Physical death is what the people were saved from in that day. An innocent animal had to die as a sacrifice to be able to get the board. David was asking for a spiritual cleansing, one from the inside. He knew only God could cleanse him. He couldn't do it himself. He needed a sacrifice. And if we go back to the next one, please, Pete, back to this first, thanks. So what does this purification do? Well, it says, and I shall be clean, verse 7, I shall be clean. It doesn't say purify me with hyssop and I may be clean or I might be clean. It says I shall be clean. That is a promise from God. So I ask you, do you believe this to be true? Do you believe that the blood of Jesus makes you completely clean? And then it says, wash me, which is 
An analogy, obviously, for a cleansing, a get rid, you put your clothes in the washing machine. If they come out dirty again, you got an issue, haven't you? And you're like, washing machine hasn't done my job that I wanted to do. Your only job is to wash my clothes. So we want to get rid and wash out all that sin. That's what David is saying. Wash me. And again, I shall, not I might, I shall be whiter than snow. Now, I don't, I don't know what's whiter than snow. I don't think it's possible. So, but what does that white, whiter than snow? And a good um, reference to this on the next slide is Isaiah 1.18. Isaiah 1.18. So what does the whiter than snow? So it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Scarlet or crimson are deep red colours which stain clothes. The deep red stain on a shirt is hard to remove. No matter how much you scrub it, it just will not come off. It just won't disappear. It's constantly on show that stain. It's a permanent stain. This is how David would have felt. He had blood-stained hands from commanding Uriah to be put to death. Nothing he could do could remain that, remove that stain on his life. But Genesis 18, 14, I think it is, the Lord says, is anything too hard for the Lord? So David had a super huge stain on his life that just wouldn't go away. So is anything too hard for the Lord? No matter how stained your life is, no matter what you have done, your sins can be made as white as snow and erased permanently today. They will be they will be as white as snow. They will be like wool. Again, this is a promise not from Jamie, because I'm a nobody. This is a promise from, from God. And we've nearly done. Um, we're going to look at verse 10 now is the last one. We're going to look at verse 10. And I've we've said this one, a renewed heart, a renewed heart. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Some of you might already know the word create. That's the exact same word used in Genesis 1 when God said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Only God can create something from nothing. David's plea was for God to do a supernatural work in him. This heart is simply, we're saying, this heart is dirty. Create in me a clean heart. Give me a newness of life and change me. If you want your car washing, where do you go? Not to my house, you don't. You go to a car wash. If you want your windows cleaning, you don't ring me. You get a window cleaner who's brave enough to climb the ladders. If you want a heart to be cleaned, you go to God. And it says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Renew can mean rebuild or repair. And the steadfast can mean to stand, to set up, affirm or fix something. So the, the analogy you can give what that might mean is, has anyone seen a program called DIY SOS? Yeah. So if anyone hasn't, there's programs where somebody's inside of the home, there's issues, so they've had a plumber come and he's messed them, he's done a terrible job and just messed them up. They might have multiple rooms that are just not working. They might have multiple children who are sharing rooms. Maybe they can't afford to get that inside changed. They need a transformation inside. So they go on this program, and then they get a transformation. So it shows you the before, inside. And at the end, when they come in, they always cry when I seem to see it because the transformation is ridiculous. 
So that same transformation is what David is feeling and wanting internally. He's saying, get rid of all that badness from me, renew me, restore me, and supernaturally change me inside out. Then it says, verse 12 says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Just like sin conceives death, Restoration restores joy. Kill sin and increase your joy today. And God forgave David in the end. So that is Psalm 51, but it would be a bit daft of me not to mention the cross. The cross. So we're on the last slide, please, Pete. The cross. I'm going to read John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, he did, he did what God sent him to do. To fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up into his mouth. The word hyssop we obviously talked about before. When I was reading, it wasn't clear whether there was some form of, some form of reference to this hyssop to what happened in the Old Testament. It wasn't clear. Um, 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished and he bowed and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit the cleansing the washing the freeing of sin now goes through the mediator jesus christ he is the final sacrifice and the jews will be celebrating passover in a few weeks time and they'll be waiting for the messiah to come and we believe that jesus is the final passover and he is the Lamb of God. And if I say two words, let's see if anybody can finish the song. What can? Yeah. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Has Jesus washed your sins away? Do you have eternal life? Do you have peace? Today's name is correct. It is a good day. Believers in Jesus are hopeful. If this is not you today, I encourage you to stop. Reflect on your life, just like David. Look to Jesus and be set free. Don't be hopeless like the world, but be hopeful in Jesus. Let's just have a prayer then. We'll have the last song. Lord, we, as a believer, we echo those words. We thank you for the board. Lord, we thank you it's washed us clean. Lord, I thank you that we now have hope. We have life. We've been transformed by your board. Lord, it's all about you. So as a church, we give you we give you the thanks and the praise and we pray Lord, that you'll do a transformation in all our hearts today. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching all. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, consider subscribing so that you'll be notified when we add new videos. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Bye.